So, Lee, uh, The Guardian has obviously a, a, a really storied past of and present of uh, being pretty early and early in investments in data and data journalism, particularly in new tools and techniques. Um, we've seen that with uh, we've seen that with WikiLeaks and NSA, the data blog that you guys had launched in 2009, which was pretty early on, um, and providing raw data sets to the public. Now you're here in, in this really important role as the editor of The Guardian US. Where do you want to take this next? What for you, what are your goals in data journalism? How do you see this evolving in, in, in the year to come? Mm. I think as you outline, uh, Data journalism has always been incredibly important to The Guardian. In 2009, we started uh, the data blog, and that has grown phenomenally since then. Uh, we've recently brought on a data editor, Mona Shalabi, in our US office here in New York. Um, and for us, really, I think data journalism sort of seeps into everything we do every day in the newsroom. So we don't always see it as a distinct proposition. It's something that is very much a part of the way that we want to tell stories, of the way that we want to humanize stories. I think, you know, we look at uh, a news proposition and talk to each other about how are we going to tell this story or what are we going to do about this that shows it in a different way. And, you know, if I think about the last week alone, we've done everything from using data to illuminate the number of attacks on planned parenthood clinics throughout the US um, and to look at, at the truth behind that to how popular the name Saint is after Kim Kardashian and Kanye West named their son that. So, you know, I think it can show you so many different things historically and um, news-wise and uh, in, in, uh, in, in many different ways, really. So it's an exciting proposition going forward, I think, and in, as part of everything we do. And do you, do you have any sort of insights in, in, in how you do journalism now because this is so ingrained in everything you do? Like, have you noticed, what are the biggest changes, for example, in how you approach a, an investigative story? Mm. I think, you know, in the past, you could have thought that data journalism could have been the preserve of, you know, spreadsheets and dull news, perhaps, or kind of very, very number heavy. And I think it's true to say that nobody wakes up every day saying, I want to come and read data and loads of statistics today. I just want to look at numbers. I think for us, it's about humanizing Some people it. in this room Some people do, in this room actually. probably do, of course. I'm, I'm not, you know, in fact, some people in this room really do. Um, but I think for us, it's about making sure that everybody in the audience can, can find it accessible, can find it, uh, you know, a human story behind it. So that's what we try and do with it, really, all the time. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, we've really moved moved along in this sort of continuum of what data journalism is. It really has been such a niche area, and we have been hiring departments that only do this. And it sounds like you guys have really gone beyond that. And it's, it's kind of, there are a few camps. There are some people who say there are these specialized groups that we do need to hire these special skills, which we'll talk about later on mm. the talent piece. But then there are others who say we shouldn't even have conversations about data journalism. It's all journalism. Mm. Um, so you, you, you guys are working on a really interesting, very timely project, yeah. Counted, mm -hmm. um, where you're creating your own data set around how many people are killed in America mm -hmm. by, by the police. By the police, yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? And, and why, do you, why do you feel that you need to create your own database mm -hmm. around this? Um, so uh, we started uh, working on this towards the end of last year because um, we were quite shocked by the fact that there was no... Uh, national database to record the number of people killed by police in the US. Um, and so we thought, what if we started to create that ourselves? Uh, and we wanted to uh, do it for a year and um, really document in this incredibly large database the number of people uh, that were being killed by police, break that down into uh, race and gender lines, location, look at an incredible amount of um, detail of what was happening in these cases so we could follow their stories. So doing, doing the work that the federal government isn't doing is, is a theme that has come up and obviously that's the job of journalists, that's mm. what we do. Um, what I find really fascinating about this particular project is the crowdsourcing piece of it mm. and I know you've employed this technique in the past. Mm. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about um, your, your reasons for doing this and, and 
just sort of the process of it. How, how is it working? Yeah, the crowdsourcing is an incredibly important element of this and it's something that we wanted involved uh, from, the, from the very beginning. Um, we couldn't do this alone. We have four reporters working on this project, but we needed the public to tell us about things that had happened in their area that might not have been reported, about um, people that they knew that this had happened to that for whatever reason may not have reached the media. So um, the way the process works is that we, we sort of are inundated with these tips that come into a tip box. Our reporters pick those up. They work to verify them. They contact local police departments, medical examiners, local courthouses, local press. They double source things, they verify them, and then we can put these um, names and figures into this database. And you know, we end up with a huge, um, huge, rich resource to then follow particular storylines within this theme that is becoming such a huge uh, theme in, in America right now. So um, as you can imagine, the enormity of the task, you know, I mean, we've got you know, four people working on this who are, who are news reporters. Um, and they are collecting data every day to bring this picture, this sort of national picture, um, to the public attention. So it's a huge, vast undertaking. Um, so, so the crowdsourcing piece, obviously, there's a there's a, a a lot of that's about trust between your audience and mm. uh, and the Guardian US. Mm. And how have you have you managed to do that in such a short amount of time? Mm. I mean, the Guardian US hasn't been around. For so long, mm. um, could you talk a little bit about that? How how have you done it, and, and what has the response been? I think um, part of it was saying from the beginning that we couldn't do it alone, and this was a project that the Guardian US was doing with your help. Was something that we said from the very beginning. Um, within a month of launching it, we had twenty thousand people as part of um, of this community. Uh, you know, the Facebook page, the Twitter. Um, handle everything was huge and people had so much information that they wanted help with that they wanted to share that they wanted verified that they wanted and needed to be checked um, so you can see the the need for it um, this this is actually shows you sort of this is just the, the opening page where we ask people to fill in this tip box and these things are coming into our, uh, the counted inbox every day and then the reporters are working to to uh, check them, but then you look, you know, we have a very traditional spreadsheet that's set up with this, and it and it's goes on and on and on and on. Um, but I think one of the really interesting things about it is when you have this data in a way that, you know, in sometimes in news reporting, you'd, you'd look for the, the news line or the story and you'd follow that. With this, it's very much data-led, so we can break down this data into what do we want to look at, how uh, do we want to look at the proliferation of taser use in some of these deaths. So let's break this down into that, wow, these figures are huge. Let's have that inform our long form read on this. Um, we've just done a, we're working on a five part series of which we've published three parts so far on Kern County, which is a location that we have honed in on because of the data in this project that shows us that it is the deadliest police force in the United States. And that has come from the figures, from the location figures in here, from our navigation on the maps that showed us that you know, there's some shocking things going on in this area, but the data has led us to that. And just one, I have one more question on the crowdsourcing piece. What, mm. um, what are your, what can you tell us about the quality of the information you're getting? Mm. Um, it varies, uh, and sometimes it can be repetitive. Sometimes it is people with uh, patches of information asking us to find more. But you know, as every journalist knows, you need a little bit, and you can then chase the rest, and that's part of what everybody's doing every day on this project. So I would say it's definitely varied, but um, it, it's also I think we've just been uh, really surprised by how huge the response to it has been. It shows the need for it, but um, I think the traffic on this database itself is uh, it's had more than a million page views in the United States, and more than I think approaching one and a half million worldwide. So. It's, it's just the impact has been enormous. Um, but also I think it has helped us illuminate, you know, there are, there are deaths here that, that people did not know about, that the public didn't know about, that the government didn't know about. I think we're up to uh, at least seven so far um, that we, uh, people that we have tracked in this database that the United States was not aware that this Have they been in touch? Yes. Can you tell us anything? Um, well, uh, one, of, one of the most important cases in the beginning uh, was 
a really tragic situation, an 18-year-old uh, by the name of William Chapman who was killed in Portsmouth. Um, and John Swain, uh, a reporter on the counter, uh, did a huge body of work on what happened to this unarmed teenager that, for some reason, we had not heard about who was killed in this car park. Shocking story. Um, and that has led to uh, the beginnings of the prosecutions uh, against the officer who, it turns out, has been involved in this kind of stuff before. So. Um, that's, that changes lives. Right. Um, yeah. So the way you go about a project like this, to me, uh, is, is sort of really resonates with your open philosophy. The mm. Guardian sort of, you talk a lot about being open um, as this overarching way of doing things. Could, could you explain that a little bit? Because I haven't really heard it articulated in a, in a sort of broader way, and I'd love to get your stance and view on that. Um, we're passionate about open journalism because to us it means that um, instead of the story ending on publication, the story begins on publication and that it's not just us pronouncing something to uh, our readers and to the world, that the readers are very much involved with what we're saying, what we're publishing and that they are, um, that there's a distinct interchange there uh, between the reader and the journalist, between the editors and our audience. Um, so is, is open something that is just sort of mindset that all of your journalists embrace? Or do you actually have people <coughs> working on making The Guardian open? Is it a job description? Um, I think it's something that we all very much embrace and believe in, but we, um, we do have um, audience teams working very hard. Uh, they are a central plank in our newsroom and our news operations to always remind us of ways we can throw that out to the public. Um, I think, you know, even in the last 48 hours with everything that's happened with Donald Trump, our response to that, I think one of the lines that Trump had said uh, in uh, the event um, when he was discussing his views on uh, Muslim Americans was, I don't care. Uh, and that to us was something that we uh, wanted to say, well, we really do care. We really do care. And this is not OK. And we want to put that out to, to the community to have mm -hmm. them feedback to us about how they feel about it. Right. Yeah. Now, data, when we talk about data, obviously, we, this is a conference about data journalism. Mm. Um, but we also use data in our newsrooms to help us understand our audience. Could you talk a little bit about how The Guardian approaches understanding your audience by using sort of analytical tools? Or how do you do that? Yes. Um, so I've got some slides here to show you. This is OFAN, which is our um, in-house analytics tool. Um, it was launched in 2011, and uh, this is like one screenshot of it that shows you some of the stories on this particular day. It's something that um, every member of staff <laughs> on editorial and commercial has to look at every day. So reporters and editors are using this tool uh, to see how their stories are doing, to see which other news organizations are picking them up, to see how they're being read between desktop, between uh, our mobile app, um, and various social media pages, so you can see the breakdown between Facebook and Google, if you can see that close, I'm not sure. Um, and the views per minute, the views per second. Um, and it is the most amazing tool, because you can see sometimes, you know, you think, well, this story is going to be huge, and then for some reason it isn't. Sometimes you think, well, this is something a bit minor, but let's do it, it's fun, and then it goes enormous. And, and this is like a minute by minute documentation of that. So I think, you know, when you think about um, traditionally in newsrooms when you may have put a story on page six and said, well, that's the page six lead, and this is my decision to do that, and whatever. And you never really knew whether uh, the reader thought that was the right thing, whether that story should have necessarily been placed there. It was a very top-down sort of decision-making process until perhaps you know, a letter to the editor three days later. Whereas with this, we can see immediately um, our stories around the world, so in our different offices in London, New York, and Sydney, what stories are having an impact and why. And could you give some examples of actions you might take based on data? What are you, what are, what's, a, what's a pattern that you see that you're often acting on? I, I'm just trying to understand how we have this data, but how are, the how are the journalists or other folks in the newsroom using this? What, what are some things that they're actually, what are they being informed by? So it can be anything from, wow, this story is huge. There's obviously a lot of interest in it. We need to do more. We need to look at other elements of it to, this headline's not working properly, should we change it? Or 
this is taking off in, a, in an enormous way. How many other things can we build around it? Um, and what happens when a really important story isn't doing very well? Well, a really important story is a really important story. And traditional news values apply. So it, it doesn't, this is an informative tool and it's wonderful in that sense, but it does not dictate uh, the decisions we would make about our daily news judgment in that sense. It is informing us on what readers want, um, and then we balance that with, I think, our traditional news values. So it's yeah. wonderful in that, in that sense. Yeah, I, I heard someone very eloquently say we're not a data-driven newsroom, we're a data-informed newsroom. Yeah, so. absolutely. This is actually, this page just shows, again, um, down the bottom you can see how the audience breakdown is, is happening throughout the United States. So this is the breakdown by state of where the audience is on this particular article. And then the colours in the line graph show Google, Facebook, um, and so on, different colours of, of where the reader breakdown is coming on that top graph. So, so, so much information. So in the spirit of open, yeah. can, you, can you imagine a day where you would open source your Guardian OFAN tool? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we're very open about it, and we, we're very open about using it and talking about it and having everybody in the newsroom use it. So, yeah. Could you open it up to other newsrooms? I mean, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a um, yeah, it's a very, very effective tool, so I'm sure, like, those conversations go on all the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, let's go back to talent. We have so many, like, uh, educators. We've got Marie, who's trying to figure out how to help uh, mid-career journalists. We've got uh, journal uh, journalists, editors. Um, I really want to get to the talent piece and the skills piece. Um, I never... Uh, uh, miss a chance to mention that the, when the Guardian US started, uh, you guys hired away three of my data journalists, um, which I'm very flattered about. But it's really hard. It's really hard to hire this, this talent, especially mm. in New York City. Mm. Um, when I was building my data team, in the, it, this was early on, but it took me almost a year to find the talent, and it wasn't even in the United States. I found folks from elsewhere. I, I'm sure this has changed now because, you know, I think so, right? Because Sarah and Maria are fixing this um, and others, of course, in the room. But um, tell us a bit about how you're recruiting, how you're finding talent. What are you looking for? Mm. I agree. It's really, really hard to find people with these, these particular skill sets. They're not necessarily traditional skill sets, but I think what you're asking for is you want people that have incredible news judgment, but you want people that can work with data, you want people that can work with spreadsheets, but you want people who can also write really well, turn that into a story, write their headlines, um, pitch ideas every day, be full of ideas, and also have fun. You know, I think we, we want to use um, data to, do, to be a great part of our mix as well, and I talk about human stories, but we want to be um, we talk about playful intelligence a lot, and I think data can play a big role in that. So it's so many different elements that come together right. to... There's been a lot of pressure, and I, d I don't know if this has sort of eased a bit now, um, but there, there has been a lot of pressure to hire folks who could be really good journalists, who also could, you know, code, mm. have the computational piece, maybe even throw in some visualization and... Mm. and, and graphics piece and mm. then hey maybe they can also manage a team yeah, um, yeah. so obviously that you know I, I don't think it's impossible I don't necessarily think you find those people but I think you can cultivate those people once you sort of bring in the right talent um, what does your sort of data team look like these days I know you've talked about this is just you know these are tasks and roles for everybody in the newsroom um, but what I'm hearing is there really still is a need for certain skills that you just, you know, you're not going to teach your entire newsroom overnight. Yeah. So what does, what does, what does your team look like now? Mm. And where do you see that going in the next year or two? We're really lucky because we, um, we have an interactive team, phenomenal interactive team who, um, uh, as Gabe, as Gabe well knows, <laughs> uh, uh, that um, is, is quite big for our newsroom uh, and they are multiple award winning everything from uh, NSA decoded to uh, the most recent Emmy we won for Beyond the Border to uh, the work they've done on Home and Square and the Counter this year. And their skill sets are all very complementary to each other, but they all bring different things into this team. So they work on these incredible visualizations. Um, and they share, they, they share those with the rest of the team in the newsroom. So they do teach other people 
um, elements of that, and they're very generous with their time in that sense, but they are the masters of making, taking some, some data set and bringing it to life in a way that you could never conceive of, I think. Yeah. Um, and what about the diversity piece? I mean, it, uh, it's, it's hard finding diversity in journalism generally. Um, when it comes to the data piece, I think it's challenging, but I think it's possible. Mm. What is your take on the diversity angle when, when you're recruiting? Mm. I think, um, to what I was saying before, uh, this, is, this is no longer a kind of um, a, a domain of one particular skill set of, of person. And I think for us, diversity is incredibly important, and we look at it all the time. I'm really proud to say that our staff in Guardian US is 59% female. It's a fantastic statistic, Ooh. and it's really, really important to us. Um, and as mentioned before, we have three female editors around the world in our, um, uh, our sites around the world. Um, we, we work really carefully on diversity and byline counts. We break that down every month in our hiring. Um, it's, it's really important to us. Um, and what about with audience? What's when you're um, obviously diversity is also with your audience, yeah. and how how are you thinking about the diversity of the audience you're trying to serve in the United States? Mm. Um, well, I think for me it was really important for us to um, get outside of a New York and DC mindset um, to be really speaking to as much of America as we could with with you know not a huge editorial staff, but. Um, we have recently appointed uh, a southern correspondent because uh, it's really important to us to tell the story of the South in a way that's not the romantic, cliched story of the South, but to tell the story of the South to the world. Um, and we hope to kind of build out that way geographically. Um, we've recently started our West Coast office, which will, will help tell huge stories out of there, uh, the drought, immigration stories, and so on, um, to reach um, what is in some parts there, you know, more than 50% Latino audience, um, which is really, really, really important to us. Yeah. Um, so with the audience, what are you finding um, works in terms of data? You've talked about bringing in a, a human angle, mm. um, sort of moving away from the drier sort of raw data sets, even though those are important and I, I know you're still doing that work. Um, what are you finding? What's resonating with people? Mm. I think I'm just remembering the order of these, but this this slide here, um, obviously gun control has been a, a, a very big um, story in the last few weeks and, and this year and many years uh, prior in America. This particular uh, interactive that we put together um, earlier in, in the year um, was huge when we published it because I think there was a real need and hunger to look at statistics in relation to this as people were grappling with the horror of what was going on. Um, and, it, and it went around the world. It's quite simple, as you can see, but really um, powerful and, and impactful. And then uh, after the most recent shootings in San Bernardino, we updated the stats there. So very, very quickly put this to uh, 1,052 mass shootings in, in as, as almost as many days. And within sort of a day or so, we're, we're talking about sort of 300,000 page views. It, it just... Um, People, there was a real need for people to have this kind of information. So it's relatively simple, but I think um, you know the breakdown of that has been a, a powerful thing to visualize and to provide the data in that sense. So, the, so back to sort of talent, because we're also talking about visualization here. Um, would you hire or do you hire non-journalists into the newsroom to do some of this work since there is, you know, since some of these job descriptions are so demanding, mm. do you do you hire people who aren't from journalism into the into journalism? I don't really think of it in a non-journalist sense, um, but we certainly um, hire people from all different sorts of backgrounds with all different sorts of degrees and um, qualifications. Uh, and uh, I think that with skills that we know will complement the other skills in, in the newsroom. But as ever, they need to have a passion and, and thought for news and constant ideas and, and ways to build things. But absolutely, I think we're really versatile and, and flex, flexible in that way. Yeah. And, and so um, <coughs> Guardian US has, especially when Gabe was there, of course, um, have done amazing visualizations um, that have won awards. Yeah. Um, what has been the response to the visualizations themselves? Are we, are you, I guess my question is, um, 
I think some of these visualizations have been targeting a super user. Right. Um, is that changing, or do we still feel like you know we have to innovate and push the push things with visualizations? Um, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, this one here on the slide uh, is about. Um, Another huge story that we've done this year, Spencer Ackerman's work on Home and Square, which is um, uh, placed in Chicago that we uh, discovered was uh, detaining people uh, without um, their constitutional rights, without access to a lawyer, and literally disappearing them. We sued the Chicago PD um, after our first series of stories on this and found out that we had, that, that the extent to which we so far understand there's been more than 7,000 people held in this facility. Um, and we had a huge raft of, of documents um, which we could not uh, use, obviously, the names and the identities of the people we needed to protect them, um, but we wanted to show the enormity of this in a way that wasn't just looking at numbers on the page. We wanted to show the, the terrible racial disparity of what was going on here, but also the, the enormity of it. So one of the visualizations our interactive team has done is on Home and Square. I encourage you to look at it because it's... Um, it really um, builds and moves in a fantastic way that tells this story in an, a very non-traditional sense. Is it interactive to the? Yeah, yeah. So you can you can really um, you know do lots of things with drop-down menus and and these these spheres um, are really powerful in the way that they move around and show um, the gravity of what's gone on and what we know so far of what's gone on in Home Square. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we are running out of time, so we're going to take it to questions. So if anyone has a question for Lee, and Lee, if you have a question for anybody in the room sure. too, I think we can, we can turn this into a conversation. We have a little bit of time. Yes. Good morning. Hi. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, so uh, in terms of the open uh, newsroom concept, um, how do you use data before you do the story? How does data inform the process of coming up with what stories you're going to cover and how you're going to cover them? Because you've described very well what happens after the story comes out, but I'm interested in the process before that. Yeah. Um, I think it's everything from, so when we're looking at, at OFAN, which we do constantly, the day of the news and the day before and the next morning we sort of wake up from overnight and look at what people have been reading all around the world and that is a huge informant to us to be like, well, what do we need to be looking at today? What are people interested in? So as far as um, being informed by the reader, I think, um, that can be incredibly powerful. But in other examples, I think, um, we, we recently did a story about um, endometriosis that we did all in all of our global offices around the world. Um, and talked about this as, as a silent epidemic that people weren't aware that one in ten women were suffering from. And we shared that around the world, and it was a different story in Australia, it was a different story in America, it was a different story in the UK. But we, we said to our readers, tell us about your experience with this, tell us about what's happening to you. And within a couple of hours, we had more than 600 women all around the world, people in Malaysia saying, I'm suffering from this, people in London saying, I need help with this. And then you... You, you have all these voices, which is really powerful, but then you have data from a call-out that you can work on a way to build more and more uh, out of that story, which is, in a sense, a traditional health story, but, but really informed by the voices of the reader. Yeah. <coughs> Gentleman at the back. Hi, I'm Jerry Hester from the CUNY J School. Um, getting back just to the uh, police map for a second, I'm curious if there's been uh, any entries that kind of went beyond the bureaucratic or systemic failure to, to report these cases and something that just smacked of, of cover-up and how that might go in terms of your reporting approach, your resources, your mission. I think um, when the counter team talk about the work they do on this project, one of the things that really has stood out to them when you're, when you're doing this day out, day in, day out, it can be quite a grim thing to be putting together, obviously. And one of the things is that, that comes up often is you see these cases that you think, this is, become, this is going to become a national scandal. This, this is, this, this, the death of this person will be emblematic of something much larger. And yet, as they're counting what's happening to these people, somehow it fades into oblivion and, and the world moves on. And I think... When you're doing that every day, that's been one of the, the shocking parts of it. Which, which of these cases are the ones that become huge? Which of them 
sink without a trace because for whatever reason there's, this is just such a huge thing that the gravity of it you cannot you cannot keep up every day with the extent of this problem so yeah I think um, more to your question that's that's why the data has, has led us to look at things like the taser use in the police force like uh, sexual assault going on in Kern County at the moment um, and the amount of deaths there in some cases from certain officers multiple times. Things like that um, have really informed our long form parts of this investigation. Gentleman with the glasses. Uh, how did you assemble the initial data for the counted and uh, was it all done manually or was there any element of automation? Um, it's all it's all done um, placed manually into a very 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 vast spreadsheet uh, that has been done out of our office and uh, I think I said before all of it sort of verified double sourced on every single uh, death that occurs but then um, when we talk about sort of sharing skills our interactive team and the sort of incredible talent they have they can do things with this spreadsheet that the, the traditional reporters then can use to break down this data into different ways constantly so I think um, you know what we want to do is is count so that we can look at the extent of the problem, so we can break things down as far as um, gender and location is concerned. As I was saying, but to be able to do that, you need to be able to manipulate the data. So the spreadsheet allows them to do that in many different ways that I think maybe we hadn't thought in the beginning. There's just so many different stories you can tell. It's a very rich data set. But before the crowdsourcing kicked in, I mean, where did you get the data? It was from us. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're putting in um, multiple, multiple record requests every day. Um, but also, it is just traditional journalism. It is searching. It is um, Google alerts on every Stainton County um, and, and building it up that way. Uh, uh, records requests, medical examiner's office, police officers. Every part of traditional journalism in searching for deaths like that that you would expect. So very, very time consuming. Over there, we haven't had to, from that side of the room yet. Oh, thanks. So in the interest of um, you know, open journalism and starting the conversation instead of ending it when you publish a story, do you find that, and, and also you mentioned that data uh, tends to give people the trust in a story, do you find that people share a data point more or more of the emotional kind of component of a story when they do decide to share it? How do you mean with the counted in particular? Or? Uh, so right, with the counted in particular or even in general, if you're using data to drive a story, is it that statistic that people are more likely to share or is it some sort of human element, a piece of I think for data? us it's definitely the human element, but I think um, not only is the data informing that and get helping us to reach that place or tell that story better, so it's very, very much a part of it, but I think the, the really, I mean it goes both ways. I think the human side of it really can have resonance, but I think when you're looking at uh, the disproportionate amount of um, uh, deaths of, of black men killed by American police. I mean, that some of those statistics are so shocking. The deaths of um, Latino people killed by police, again, shocking. And I think when you're looking at racial disparity, sometimes those figures have such powerful cut through that they have the impact. You just cannot sort of turn away from that. It is, it is really powerful. You had a question, right? Somebody over here? Had a, you had a question. I was just curious if shooting deaths that are undocumented and that are missing? Um, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, well, I, I think um, because of, like I said, because of the enormity of, of the task and because we're looking at not just shooting but every kind of death here. So um, we, I think I would like, to, I think what we have done is the most comprehensive count that exists in America. And I, I believe that, the team believes that. I think um, the work that's been done on this um, shows that this is the most comprehensive account that exists um, this year. But I think you, you never know 100%. But I think the way that we've set it up, because the public is helping and because we're checking everything so much, that it, is, it has become the most comprehensive. Jeff? Good morning, Lee. Hi, Jeff. Um, congratulations are in order, I think, because you shamed the FBI and the count into doing their own list. Um, so Just last night. Yeah. Yes, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, a round of applause for that, I think. Uh, how do you measure, how, how do you view impact now? OFAN's a wonderful tool for immediate attention, but how are you, how are you seeing impact? What's guiding you as the editor of Guardian US? Um, 
I think it's a couple of things with this project. I think um, when we started it, we um, we said what did we want it to achieve, and we were calling for a mandatory national database. That's what we were calling for. Currently, the Justice Department is piloting one, and the FBI has announced last night that they want to um, build something that is based on the way that we have collected this data. So not just the shooting deaths, but um, a holistic attempt to, to build a national picture. Um, so that is, that is fantastic news that this will, that we will go into 2016, hopefully, with these different things building to get this information. But I think, as I was saying before, when you, um, when you look uh, not only at the huge audience reach that this has had, but also when you're bringing to light cases that nobody has heard of, when you are um, telling stories that lead to prosecutions that change people's lives, that to us um, is the impact of this. I, I had a two-part question. I think Jeff's question actually just preempted one of them because that question was, how are government agencies starting to react right. to this? So I, I'm going to twist this and say, one, as a result of what you've been doing, has it become easier to get information from police and government agencies? And the second question is more when you're doing your analysis, are you able to drill into and look at what precipitated the speci a, a specific shooting and killing and what and how that plays out? What were the circumstances? Has there been any ability to do the analysis of those circumstances? Because yes, there's a killing, but okay, there's something predicated that and was that a valid response or not? Are you able to get that deep into it? Yeah, so with every um, with every single case we're looking at a lot of detail whether this person was armed, whether they were unarmed, where they were, what the exact precise circumstances were, what the um, status of the investigation is, whether the investigation is taking place by police in the same county uh, uh, and so on. So there's an incredible amount of detail placed on every card that then is followed up with FOIA requests with um, public information requests uh, with medical, medical examiner's information. So, so yes, and then we decide which of those we're going to drill down to further if they are telling a wider national story. Um, and then just back to the first part of your question, was there a part of Jeff's that, that I didn't answer? What is, are you getting easier? Oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> really? Of course not. Yeah, no. No, 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 no. It's still, there's still so much legwork involved to get that information every day. Um, yeah, as I say, when you're talking about four reporters doing the job of a government department, yeah. it's a lot of work. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're up for time. But thank you, Lee. Thank you so much for sharing <laughs> the important work with